I bought this 2.1 subwoofer amplifier off Amazon a little bit ago for a personal project that I've been working on, and I didn't expect much. I think it was $33 delivered at the time. Uh, it's currently not unavailable, um, but you, as you can see from the board, it's fairly basic. It's got some big chunky uh, power filtering, uh, provides two 50 watt channels plus 100 watt as a subwoofer channel, takes 12 to 24 volts, and you really do need to give it 24 volts to drive, and it is based off the TPA3116 uh, chip. And there's actually two of them on here, one that drives the left and right channels, and one that is bridged to provide the uh, subwoofer channel on this side. You can see from the photos, it's it's a fairly decent board. It's got uh, DC input on the back. There's the, uh, the outputs for the subwoofer, the left and right channel, and the audio inputs. And then it has the five uh, volume control or little potentiometers on the front plus a uh, the master volume doubles as an on-off switch with the click uh, on the far left intent detent sorry um, and I mean even from the back here you can see that this is just straight out of China it's got Chinese characters written on here I'm not sure if you can read that but I'll zoom in on the board in a bit but that's just you know premium grade Chineseium um, and it came with some little dials and whatnot um, but uh, one thing I did note is that most of these components, well, you get what you pay for. $33 is, uh, cuts had to be made somewhere, and most of these components are just terrible. Um, so what I have embarked on doing is upgrading the board, so to speak, to bring it up to a spec that actually works properly for what I'm intending on doing. So as you can see, here's the board itself, um, and I have clearly removed <laughs> quite a lot of components off of there. Um, but let's start with the obvious ones as to what I've removed, and I'll go into the detail of why I have removed them. So you can see here, the two heat sinks have been removed from the board there, and I'm, I did that mostly just because I wanted to replace the, well, the heat sink compound, the gunk that they put on there from the factory, uh, with some fresh stuff and just the right amount, because there was way too much under there. Um, I've removed the five potentiometers, including the power switch one, from their positions there. Um, and the one thing that I found, and I'll go into it a little bit, is that these uh, were particularly terrible. Like I've even marked this one with C for crap because it was just awful. It was actually, one of these is completely broken. That's the crap one, so I'll show you that in a minute. Um, across the top here, I've rem removed these six filter capacitors. Um, and on the side here, I have removed the rather large 6800 microfarad uh, power input filter capacitor and the input power to the, for both of the chips had their own dedicated 220 microfarad input capacitors as well. Um, so these ones, they're not too bad. Uh, there's no particular reason I replaced these other than I don't know what these brands are, Hengjing and these small uh, Heinz, H-Y-N-C-D-Z, so I don't know these brands um, and I'd rather have something reputable in there and kind of the same for these uh, little output capacitors. So they're all exactly the same markings, um, unmarked, unbranded, nothing on them but uh, the labeling which says 684J100, that is 68, six, eight, 680 microfarad, 100 volt. And um, one thing that you'll note is that one of them even is actually taller than the others. So while they are theoretically identical, uh, well, one thing we'll do is I'll, I'll show you how they are not. Let's move this out of the way, put that to the side, and let's get a meter in here. So let's get my Digitech meter in, and let's put this to turn it on, switch it over to capacitance measuring, and let's measure this there. So let's pop that lead there, and another lead on here, and let's see, this 680 nanofarad capacitor, sorry, 680 nanofarads, is registering as 800. So, yeah, that's, again, it's kind of if you get what you pay for. Let's have a look at another one. And what do we get here? This one is 620. So even amongst themselves, you know, if they were all 800, I could understand it. But uh, as you can see, there's another 800. 
This one. Oop, 575. That one's just awful. Uh, let's have a look at the last. 795. That's good enough to call 800. Last one. 717. So yeah, as you can see, there's complete utter variance amongst these ones. Not not quality. So yeah, just let's just, let's just get rid of those. Let's have a look at these these the hind Hinkins, I don't even know. So let's uh, test those. 220 microfarad is going to... Oops. Let's do that again. Click on that and click on that. And let's see what we get. This one will take a second. 216. So again, yeah, these ones, not too bad. 216 for a fairly cheap component isn't out of the realm of accuracy. Let's have a check of the other one. And 216 again. So those are those are fine. I probably could have left those in place, but as I said, I prefer to have something name brand. And I'm not going to bother checking the 6800. Um, I have checked this in the past and it does actually measure at about 6600, which is acceptable, but it does take a few seconds to for this uh, uh, meter to charge it up to just to test it. So what I've got instead of those components is this little order here. So now for the big power, we have good quality Nichicon. So we've got two 2200 Nichicons and a 6800 microfarad Nichicon as replacements. And for the smaller output capacitors, we have these delightfully red Wima 6800 nanofarad. So yeah, six of those to replace the six of those. One of those to replace that one. One of those to replace the two. Uh, two of those to replace the two smaller ones. Now, one thing I, I did actually make a mistake on is that this one is actually slightly taller. And on the board, one thing of note is that the leads fit into here. I know that's backwards, but it folds over. And yeah, unfortunately, I did have to remove. This is one of the main reasons I did remove that. DC connector. Not that I was using it anyway, as I use the two screw terminals for DC in there anyway. So yeah, that's what we've got for these. Now let's have a look at these potentiometers, shall we? So how are we going to test these? Let's grab a breadboard. Now, let's have a look at, let's just have a look at any one of these and we'll test these back pins in the middle. Pop it in here. Let's test, let's grab a couple of jump leads. Let's test from the wiper to the out. And let's put the meter on ohms and take it out of auto range. And these are 50k ohm. So let's pop it into two decimal places. Actually, let's go to three decimal places and see. So now this is Next out, it gets to 48 kilo ohms. Yeah, it's close enough to 50 kilo ohms to be acceptable. But if I wipe that down, it seems fine. And most of these do. Some of them have some small jumps here and there where it uh, jumps a bit too quickly. This one, this one fully maxed out is at 50.3, so the other one, like I said, was at 48. There is some variance there, and obviously that's not great, but if we wipe it down, oh, look at that massive jump right between 45 and 41. If I wipe that really carefully, it's still very jumpy, but yeah, these aren't the greatest of quality. So let's have a look at that one that I marked C for crap. So now let's put it, let's turn it all the way to the left. So this is fully off, should be registering as 50 kilo ohms. And the way that I've got that wired up. 14.8. Now if we wipe it all the way to the left, to the right, sorry, it got, starts going down, goes to zero, and then bounces up to, let's do that very gently again, well it's out of range. So let's actually put that back in auto range. Oops, let's put that in mega ohm, see where it actually Oops, went too far. Put that in mega ohms, see where we got to. 
it actually jumps up all the way to 26, I think I saw there. Anyway. And then if you keep on wiping, it comes back in range and goes to 30 kilo ohms. So obviously, I think this one was on the bass volume, which actually controlled the output of the subwoofer speaker volume. Um, and I noticed that in immediately upon usage where wiping that uh, potentiometer across and the, the speaker volume would increase and then drop and then suddenly jump back up. So it's, yeah, got great components. Um, I'm, I am going to be replacing these, but uh, what I'm going to actually be doing is uh, replacing these with a separate uh, circuit that uses a microcontroller and digital potentiometers to be able to digitally control uh, all of these uh, potentiometer values, um, which just kind of enables the speaker to be a little bit more techy, and I'll be covering that in a future video. But for now, let's have a look at replacing the other components on the board here. So let's get the bad ones over there, bring in the good ones down here, and let's see what we need to do to get this going. So let's grab a little bit of solder and get started. So let's uh, let's get started with the bigger through-hole components for now. So these two capacitors. Cardboard. So now, thankfully, these boards are nicely silk screened to indicate where the positive terminals are. So they should be actually pretty straightforward to pop in there. Hopefully they fit nicely. Oh, look at that. Perfect, perfect fit. So that negative on that side goes up, positive goes down into that terminal. Oh, it looks like I did not desolder that particularly well at all. You can see in the middle there that the connector's not actually fitting in, so let's give that a quick clean up with my iron. Just pop some fresh solder in there. Let's grab my solder wick. Let's grab my solder wick and dab that away. Okay. Now let's try mounting these again. So that's much better. Okay, pop the other one in the other hole. Oops, did this one backwards. Okay, so these are pretty much in there. Let's get those soldered on. Now these are going to need a little bit more heat dumped into the leads because they are rather large. Which is good for their power rating. Okay. And that one. And last lead. Hold it for another second. And that looks good. Okay. Now. Let's have another quick look at those. Those connections look pretty good. And they're nice and mounted on the board. All right, so now while we're here, let's have a look at the nice niche con. So we've got the positive here, that means that's a negative. Let's put that there. So now one thing that we want to do is be able to fold this over. So let's get that started first and figure out exactly how far we need to fold you. Let's, let's get those leads folded over on the, on the bench so that we can just place them in. That looks good. Okay. Oops, let's bend those out. That leg out just a bit. Alright, and then let's place it in there. Nice and flush with the board. Pop that down. Our iron. Now these leads are very thick, so we are definitely going to have to dump a bunch more heat into this lead before we even think about soldering it on. What I might do is actually hit 
that just a little bit of my fox pen here. Just to give clean the contacts and get a little bit of help. So there we go. There we go. Heat drives into it beautifully. Okay, same with the other one. Circle around it. And double solder. And there we go. Let's inspect those contacts again. They look great. Okay, so let's just grab our bleed croppers here. Crop those off. Let's make them perfectly flush. Okay, that's good. So now let's have a look at doing the other components, so these Wema ones. Now, me being a little bit OCD, I'm going to want to put these all in the right, in the same orientation. So let's make sure we do that. Now, I probably should have done these first as they're actually shorter, but hey, yeah, that's the order that I do things in. Now, what I'll do instead. Oh, put that one in backwards. Okay. Last one. All right, now let's put that down. A sec. What I'll do is use a little bit of electrical tape. Love this stuff for this reason in particular. Tape all those together and then tape them down to the other components. Try to keep them in the right. Oops, that hasn't worked at all. Let's pull them out. All right. Let's skip that. Let's do them the old-fashioned way, one at a time. So, let's just get a bit of solder on my tip and pop that one in there. Let's hold it. Just tin the tip a little bit more again. The next one. It in. Do that tip. Okay. Put more solder on the tip. And rinse. Repeat. Okay. Now let's follow that up. Properly. Soldering on the other legs. Okay, all done. There's our lima capacitors in place. All nicely oriented with the text facing outwards. We've got our two power capacitors in the right orientation as well, and our big chunky bastard as well. So now, what I'll do just to verify that everything's right is plug this into my bench supply, give it a bit of juice. Run it at 24 volts as it likes that. We're not going to be actually giving it any real power though, so it should be fine to run these chips without heat sinks for just a moment. What we're looking for here is a. Let's just get a couple of leads. Now, the connectors here. Let's do that one. For our positive is yellow and our negative will be green. I can't read those connectors. Now, one thing that we're going to have to be doing here, so it's positive was this one, negative was this one. And now because our power switch is missing, I'm going to need another jumper lead just to bridge these two connectors here, which is the power switch lead. And then let's flick on our power supply, and there should be an LED up the side here that indicates that it's turning on. 
and that did not work. Interesting. Okay, let's have a quick old troubleshoot as to why. So let's bring our meter in, figure out what I did wrong. So, so let's put that on volts and just verify that we are actually getting current from our power supply. Yep, there's our 24 volts. And let's pop this over and check if we are getting anything across our sources out of that. Okay, there's our 24 volts from the power supply on these capacitors. What about this voltage regulator at the back here? So that should be putting out. Ooh, well that's interesting. That's not right. So this voltage regulator should have. Ooh, I have. A bit of ground lead somewhere, I think. That voltage regulator should not have 24 volts on the back side of it. It should be putting out 3 volts. Sorry, 5 volts. Hmm. So I think I may have shorted something somewhere. Not quite sure where, though. But let's have a quick cursory look over the board. look into that. And I'm back. So here's what I found and it's confusing. Um, I don't know why they would have done this, uh, but here we are and I guess this is China, as I said, cheap boards, bottom dollar. So we've got 12 volts coming in here. The power pins here are bridged and obviously there should be a little blue LED that lights up right there and obviously nothing. Um, one thing I noted was that I removed the little uh, DC power jack and I didn't, well, I didn't expect that to matter. But here we go, if I put the power jack in, nothing connected to it, turns on. So what I'm finding is actually the two pins right here are bridged by the power jack and for some reason this is a absolutely critical earth junction that is going to need to be bridged so I will not leave this in here and instead I will just put a small jumper across these two and use that to continue getting power without having to have the energy con kind of bent up poorly like this but anyway, uh, that's all I have on this particular project until I get some additional parts in which to replace these terrible potentiometers with a nice digital uh, controller board. Uh, anyway, that's it. Thank you for watching.